My name is Cameron Van Dyke, and I'm a university professor and product designer. I've been working here on this property to build a micro eco village um, for students. We are standing on a south facing ridge in the mountains of North Carolina in the United States. We're just a 12 minute drive from Appalachian State University where I teach furniture and product design. In 2017, after a pretty typical life as a suburban and urban couple, my wife and I decided that we needed to try to live with a smaller footprint and closer to nature. And so we were able to um, have an experience here in the mountains of North Carolina where we lived off the grid in this cabin uh, on a thousand acres of land. We lived mostly outside collecting fuel for heating and cooking. We walked a mile to feed the goats and we homeschooled our 11 year old nephew. Although we gave up the modern conveniences of electricity, running water and central heat, we gained the luxuries of a direct experience of the weather, caring for animals, close proximity to each other, and meaningful physical labor. Our values profoundly changed through this experience, and not only did we discover more joy and appreciation of life, but we also learned to live joyfully with a lot less material and energy consumption. After the changes we experienced living off the grid, we began to wonder if there was a way that we could share those experiences with others, particularly the design students that I work with. And so in 2018, we bought this seven acre parcel in order to create a place where students could come and have a transformative experience by living in a closer relationship with the natural world. I want to quickly share with you how we developed this site entirely with student help. In January 2018 we began first to clear trees from the building sites and to create a route for the driveway, then to saw trees into lumber, build our first dwelling, create outdoor living areas, build outdoor decks, split firewood, create wood storage racks, build a rainwater catchment system, build a solar electrical system, create a terrace garden, build our second dwelling, build more wood storage, build a third dwelling, build yet some more wood storage, and improve our systems and do maintenance to our existing structures. Our infrastructure now consists of these three dwellings. Our personal home, affectionately referred to as the taco truck. The outlook, which is a prefabricated building with an old billboard used for the siding. And lastly, that which is currently being called Dylan's Place, which was completed this summer and is designed to be shared by two students at a time. Let me take a second and explain to you how this project works. Over 30 different students have worked here, some for just one day and others for most of the summer. We pay them for their work and I teach them the skills needed to do the various jobs. I design and plan the projects, but I remain open to the ideas of the students and often implement their suggestions. Those that end up living here pay a reasonable amount each month and that gets rolled back into the project. There is no work expected of the students that live here other than to manage their own water and firewood supply and to pack out any waste that they create. There is no lease and the students are free to move out whenever they would like. It was very important to us that the students have as much autonomy and flexibility as possible in the community, understanding all the other pressures of being a university student. All right, I know that I've kind of zipped through this fairly quickly, and um, I think it'd be a great time to just kind of show you around the property just a little bit. So um, we're standing outside of the main house where Rachel and I live. Um, and uh, so uh, that's also known as the taco truck, as I said earlier. Um, coming through here, we've got uh, some covered space and uh, a little bit of a work area here. We created a garage um, by using uh, stacks of wood, and so 
Uh, of course, the students created this, and now we can store our tools and things in there. So Nephi Josiah has this uh, cargo trailer as his workspace. Josiah is homeschooled, and he is uh, big into mechanics, and so uh, he's out here quite a bit of time. We're walking up the center of the ridge, as I said earlier, south facing, which is, gives us great solar exposure. And so we have our solar trailer up here. Um, that was built with the uh, sustainability department at Appalachian State. Um, we have 2.5 kilowatts of panels here and a 10 kilowatt hour battery. Um, and we can invert up to 5,000 watts. And basically, this runs our three refrigerators. Why don't we head up to Jake's house now? Howdy. Good morning. You have a minute to talk with us? Yeah. Come on in. All right. It's cozy in here. It's <laughs> I um, appreciate you taking a few minutes um, to talk with us, and uh, I just want to let our viewers know this is an unrehearsed uh, interview, and so um, so I have just a couple questions for you. Um, and But first I wanted to say something, and I don't know if I've shared this with you yet, but when you first came and looked at this about a month ago, because you've been here three weeks, mm -hmm. um, you seemed very reluctant. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. And um, I recall thinking, you know, I wonder if he's going to even try this. And so I, I said to you, well, you know, just, just try it. Just come for the weekend. Yeah. And then three or four days later, we came back after being gone for the weekend, and there was a much different story. <laughs> what yeah. happened between the moment that you came here and then four days later? I think that it was just slightly out of my comfort zone in the beginning. Like, I, I had the biggest space I'd lived in before here. So I was really spread out and I had a lot of things. And I think that once I came here and released all the, I had just shoved everything in my car, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a clear space and I think the difference in sunshine, like I lived in a basement, so it really mm -hmm. made a huge difference in the amount of light that was coming in here. And it right. just felt really natural. I had a place for everything. It wasn't cluttered and it felt yeah. good. You said to me that, and I don't know if I can quote this perfectly, but this is the most perfect place I've ever lived, or something most along those in most comfortable space that I've been. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, how could this? By the way, th this is an eight by ten building. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With a loft. Yeah. And a little tiny bathroom, corner Well, not even a bathroom. A toilet, a sink, a stove, a desk. Mm -hmm. How could this be the most comfortable place you've ever lived? I think that I've never been conscious of where I put things before. Like I've never had a storage area for all of my, you know, kitchen things and all my clothes. And it was just kind of shoved in there and I didn't downsize enough to be comfortable in the size of the space that mm -hmm. I was. And I've just never really given an effort. But every time I move into a new space, I try to get a little bit more organized. And this one, I really had to commit to it. <laughs> and it just feels good to, it feels like very, light and clutter free in here and mm -hmm. it just feels nice to be here and yeah i love it what uh positive surprises have you discovered in being here like, that you didn't think that you would mm -hmm. encounter i would say the first night when i came back the connection to knowing where my resources come from was the biggest thing mm -hmm. it was like not having a bottomless pit of like i can turn on the water and it goes forever and i need to make sure that I'm conserving water, even though we're collecting for rain, it's still yeah. kind of a pain in the butt when it's really cold <laughs> to go walk outside. And um, firewood, it just felt strange to be getting rid of something, to like see it vanishing before my eyes when I first started living here, but I've adjusted to it. Right. Um, I guess for my last question then, like what, what has changed in your life because of this experience? Or maybe even more important, what do you think you might use going forward? You know, what, what might be different going forward? Mm -hmm. I'd say it's definitely made me reconsider what my goals are in life and where I want to, what type of space I want to live in. Me and Audrey were talking about it yesterday, and mm -hmm. a lot of her friends are focused on money and 
being successful, but it just made me reconsider, like, I don't need much to be content in the size of space. Like, I'd much rather live in a thoughtful space than a large space where I just have a bunch of crap that I need to fill. That's why I've never moved into a house, is because I don't have enough stuff to fill it. And I don't want to live in an empty home that just feels strange. Right. So you feel obligated to fill it, and it just doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. It's definitely made me reconsider what type of space I'm by myself in in the future. That's awesome. Well, thanks a lot for letting us barge into your place yeah. this morning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> have a, have a, a wonderful day, whatever you're exploring, and uh, yeah. we will see you later. Absolutely. So that's Jake's place, and uh, let's go down, and I'd like to show you Dylan's place. So this is Dylan's place. Um, he's been here for three months since the beginning of the semester. He's also one of those students that did quite a bit of work here on the property and in fact had a lot to do with clearing the site and, and getting it prepped for the, for the house. So let's go and uh, take a look. Morning Dylan, are you here? morning yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to say kind of like my interview with Jake this is totally um, unrehearsed for the people that are watching um, but, but I wanted to get like a very fresh um, just kind of you know gut reaction to my few questions one of the big uh, themes of this project is the idea of giving up certain things and, and, and getting to replace them with other things um, what would you say have been the biggest losses and then the biggest gains and how do those you know, trade-offs kind of um, work together? I don't know if I would describe anything as a loss. Okay. It's, it's not, I don't feel like I've lost anything. It's more of just adapting to something different. I mean, not having, you know, plumbing has been, <laughs> you know, it is a big change, but yeah. I wouldn't say like, not having plumbing is a loss. It's just, okay. you know, it's just a different mindset. Do you get anything in return for not having plumbing? Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely notice the my water usage, and I'm much more conscious of you mm -hmm. know, everything that I have to do in order to wash dishes or you know, um, brush my teeth even in the morning. You know, like, I'm very conscious of that, and I think that's a good thing. Um, yeah. So when you can just turn on a tap, you don't have do you think that you would do anything differently, you know, in the future now that you've had this experience? Absolutely. Um, what do you think? I think, you know, like just even being in here for a week, you start to understand how much space actually is and, you know, how much space you actually need for things. Like, this is almost too much space for one person, <laughs> you know, and at, like, I don't necessarily need all of that. So it's kind of, it's giving me an interesting perspective on, you know, what my kind of goals are for, as I picture, you know, my professional life and, mm -hmm. you know, owning a house or what have you. And there's different things that I think now I would, am including in that picture that I wasn't previously. Right. Um, and it's more just, you know, minimizing, you know, lifestyle and, you know, what objects we kind of, have to use and not necessarily taking you know like I don't know if I would go off the grid but you know you could definitely put in place measures to you know limit water usage or you know having a solar panel array to you know generate most of your power and then sell it back to the power company as right. you know just typically um, I don't know if I would ever go just completely off the grid yeah I uh, not that we're totally off the grid here. I mean, we can hear the cars now, but <laughs> um, right. But at least you know, in a sense of power, like I think you know, there's definitely a lot of you know things that we can bring into like you know, quote unquote modern world yeah. that would be very beneficial for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, thanks for letting us stop by. Yeah. We really appreciate Always. it. By the way, since we're down here, I thought I'd mention that we're we're in a pretty special climate here. We're in the south in the U.S., and so it, it doesn't get terribly cold here. And we're also 3,600 feet up, and so it doesn't get terribly warm here. And so you have a pretty moderate climate for doing the kind of thing that we do. 
And that's important because um, being in these you know, small structures, it's really important to be able to kind of spread out into the outdoors. And of course, that's part of what we're trying to accomplish, right, is have a, a better relationship with the natural world. Um, it does rain here a lot, however, and that's wonderful in terms of getting our water, um, but it is kind of a problem in terms of getting wet. And so one of the things we've done in terms of creating outdoor space is to do these, these tarp systems um, in order to create a space outdoors that can be enjoyed even when it's raining. Let's talk a little bit about the greater purpose of this project. Um, and you have to excuse me, but I have a lot to say in this regard, and I'm going to have to read it to get it right. Um, first of all, we're hoping this to be a laboratory for living, where we test ideas and compare them against the norms that we have and see if there isn't something better. I think we can all agree that we need a more equitable relationship with the natural world. We need change, but how do we change? Um, this presentation is titled Inspiring Public Imagination Through a Micro Eco Village for Students. And I want to take a minute to explain what I mean by public imagination. We're all familiar with the concept that in order to make change, we must first visualize that change and then desire it. This is true on an individual level and true at the level of society. But one of the big problems for the sustainability movement and for the challenge of climate change is that what most people visualize is something they do not want. So it looks like an inconvenience to them or austerity to them or, God forbid, a, uh, an attack on the American lifestyle to them. So our goal is to introduce people to a lifestyle option that rather than being based on austerity and loss, it is instead based on finding new kinds of luxuries and new kinds of joys that are only available because of what we give up. Um, I'm reminded of the Buckminster Fuller quote that says, you never change anything by uh, fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new prototype that makes the existing model obsolete. And this has kind of been a big, big Buckminster Fuller fan, and this has been sort of a mantra for me in my life. Um, so I want to be clear that what I'm showing you today is not just a place where a professor and his students live in the woods, but a place that is hopefully a prototype for a more authentic relationship with both the earth and each other. When experienced by our visitors, we hope that it helps create public imagination for a better future. So um, our goal ultimately is to create a small, sustainable learning community that provides a fully immersive experience for the students that live full time on the property. And the goals of this community based project are these four goals. First, to discover through first hand daily contact new options for sustainable living, to improve those discoveries through iteration and prototyping, to normalize those new behaviors so as to be acceptable to the general public and to share our experience with the general public so that they might both imagine and desire the change that we are sharing with them. So I guess in closing, I would ask us a question. As educators, architects, creative people, um, as creators of the built environment, are we really going to put our money where our mouth is? And can we find ways to bring people along while we're doing that? Can we inspire people to imagine and desire a different kind of future that aligns with the biophysical constraints of the earth? Um, let's stop just thinking sustainably. Let's act sustainably and bring people along with us. Thanks for your interest in this project. To learn more, please visit thefuturepeople.us.